be here as he about to talk about uh, the new horizons of Pluto. Uh, we are in the last phase of a very, very long journey. Uh, this last week was the sort of pass of the nine years since we launched this mission from Earth, and it's going to get to Pluto in uh, just six months, in July 14th. So I'm going to tell you a bit about the mission. I can tell you a bit about Pluto. We're going to talk about that whole new environment out there, the third realm of the solar system that many of you have maybe not heard about. It's been discovered since uh, the 19, uh, 1992, basically. Um, but we'll talk a bit about Pluto and so on uh, as we go along. And indeed, ask questions uh, as we go. So let's talk about the planets. You all know the planets. Okay, so we start with the uh, rocky planets. They are Mercury. Okay, then we go to big one. And Neptune. Okay. And then we have little blue dog. Okay. Everybody loves little blue dog. I don't know why, but they do. And I think it's great and, and, and that's totally fabulous. So let's talk a little bit about Pluto. Pluto was first discovered by a young man called Kai Tombaugh, an American young lad who was, wanted something to do between high school and college. So he went to the uh, observatory in, in uh, Arizona, and he spent many a night looking through his telescope at, on the left. And he uh, photographed the night sky, and he, he did photographic plates in those days, not paper even, for glass plates and he would look and compare the glass plates and look for objects that were moving relative to the stars. So we all know the stars are very far away, they don't move very much, but when you have planets moving around relative to the stars, they're much closer to the earth, closer to the sun, they move much faster. So looking for things that move relative to the stars will tell us about the planets. And indeed, in 1930, he found this object that was moving around the stars. They had a competition to name it, and a young girl from England, which is where indeed I grew up, as you can tell from my accent maybe, um, a young girl uh, named it Pluto. So that was in 1930. Now we have digital technology. Your phones, your cameras use this digital technology that allows you to put pictures and superimpose them and look for things that blink, come and go on the left, or move as on the right. And indeed, since 1992, we have discovered thousands of these Pluto-like objects in the outermost part of the solar system using this modern technology. And we named this region, not the asteroid belt, which is between which two planets? Mars and Mars and Jupiter. Jupiter. These, at this asteroid belt, these objects are out beyond the orbit of Neptune. And they're named after a Dutch man called Kuiper, rhymes with Viper, um, who uh, came up with this idea that there were objects in the outermost part of the solar system. So we now know there are many of them. And here is an example. This is a download from a website from December 3rd, but not a lot has changed since December 3rd. And what you will see is these round circular orbits of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. You will see Pluto at the bottom. And then you will see these, all of these red objects, are the objects of the Kuiper belt. The red and the, and the white ones are the objects of the Kuiper belt. The blue ones are actually um, asteroids that are in the same orbit as, as Jupiter. I'm not going to think about those. But look at those red objects. And then you will notice that since 1992, we've discovered thousands of them. But you'll notice there's a bit of a gap. There's a bit of a gap at the bottom in the direction of Pluto. And you'll see there's a bit of a gap up here. And I suspect there are some amateur astronomers in the community who can maybe tell me why it's very hard to look in these two particular directions of the sky and find an object that is moving relative to the stars. Any amateur astronomers or professional astronomers in the audience who would like to hazard a guess as to why these two particular directions are hard to find Kuiper belt objects? Anybody want to guess? 
galactic plane. The galactic plane. Perfect. This is the direction of the Milky Way, which means there are billions and billions, as, as Carl Sagan would say, of stars, and so it's hard to see an object move relative to those. And this is really a big deal for us with the New Horizons mission, because this happens to be in the direction of Pluto, and so we have to think about finding an object in this direction that we want to go to after we've gone past Pluto. Okay, I'll come back to that towards the end of the talk. So when we look at the plane of the planets, and here we have uh, Neptune in white circular orbit and Pluto in a uh, red uh, eccentric orbit, um, we'll see that, and I'm going to just go back and play that again um, so you can get to see that again. You can see that uh, Pluto's orbit is inclined, as are many actually other objects, uh, and it's not in the plane of the planets, and it's also elliptical, moving a little closer to the sun at times than Neptune's orbit. Now they never collide, Uranus and ne sorry, uh, Neptune and Pluto never collide because these orbits are actually resonant orbits, so that Pluto goes around the sun twice for every three times that Neptune goes around, so it's safe, it's a safe orbit, and so every time their orbits cross, um, Pluto, Neptune is not there, so Pluto doesn't hit it. And so this is a, true of many of these other objects, and these are sort of like safe orbits that have evolved over time, uh, and so uh, Pluto is safe from being captured by Neptune, even though it goes inside, sometimes closer to the sun than Neptune. So let's think about some of these objects in the Kuiper Belt. Uh, they are all sorts of different colors, some of them have moons and different sizes. Some of them have moons, some of them don't. Pluto has a moon called Sharon. Um, this one over here um, has a moon, and then some of the other ones have moons. But notice that these sizes, relative to the asteroid belt, at the bottom we have the three largest asteroids, Ceres, Pallas, and Vesta. And you can see that uh, these Kuiper Belt objects tend to be bigger even than our asteroids. So these are objects in the outermost part of the solar system, the Kuiper Belt, uh, which are in fact very icy objects of different colors, which is an interesting question, why they have these different colors uh, in the outermost part of the solar system. So when we think about Pluto's orbit, it orbits the sun every 248 years. And so we've got some historical events around this orbit to give you a sense of the scale, the time scale, for this orbit, and you'll see the discovery is the bottom right, uh, back in 1930 by Clyde Tombo, and since then we have had the space age. Uh, Pluto was closest to the sun, perihelion, in 1989. We celebrated that at the University of Colorado with a keg of beer, and just to show how old a long time ago this was, we could actually drink beer on campus. We couldn't possibly do that now. Um, but you can see that when we fly by Pluto in 2015, it's as Pluto is moving away from the sun, moving slightly further away from the sun in its eccentric orbit. So as I mentioned, um, Pluto is sometimes closer to the sun than Neptune, and many people did think it was an escape moon, but in fact, on the right, and this is a fairly complicated plot, but think of it as having Neptune fixed, that's the N over here, fixed in this system and allowing Pluto to go around. In fact, Pluto gets closer to Uranus any time than it does to Neptune. So they make this dance, uh, but they never really get close. And this is true of many objects in our solar system, including Earth and our neighbor Venus. So back in uh, 1978, this astronomer here, uh, Christie, was looking at uh, Pluto and he was trying to measure its location this is a negative picture on the left, so you have to flip the white and the black. Uh, so this black object is Pluto, and you'll see there's a sort of funny lump on the side in the second picture. Uh, and in fact, that fuzzy blob was in fact detected to be a moon that was detected back in 1978. And so here we are, we have a, uh, uh, a scale of Pluto's moon Sharon and Pluto on the right, uh, and I want to give you a sense of these are in size, scaled in size and scaled in distance, so they're accurate. 
Um, how big do you think the Earth would be if we were to put the Earth in the middle of this picture? Imagine in your mind how big Earth would be. Okay? You got it in your mind? This is the size it would be. So it's quite large, the Earth, compared with Pluto and Pluto's moon Charon. And you can see that these would be orbiting really quite close to Earth if they were in that scale. So another way of thinking of it is to think of the amount of the United States, Pluto and Sharon next to each other would, would fit into the United States. Um, I point out that both Pluto and Sharon are bigger than Texas. This means they're planets in my definition. <laughs> we'll back to that later. But a more useful sense of scale is the moon. And you can see here that the moon, which is about the size of the United States, the Earth's moon, um, is, is you can put Pluto and Sharon side by side to fit to the moon. <laughs> this gives you a sense of the scale of these objects. But this is the picture that we have, the very, very, very best picture that we've ever taken of Pluto. The very, very best picture. And we've been looking at Pluto, remember, since 1930 using the very best telescopes. This is Hubble. And so you see patches that are black, patches that are yellowy orange, patches that are whitey. And that's about it. Do you see mountains? Do you see valleys? Do you see impact craters? No. We have no idea what is on the surface uh, of, this, of this object. So here is a familiar object that is just as fuzzy as that picture of Pluto. And those of you who've been, come, we've been visiting to talk about your classes, keep your mouth shut when I show you this. But those who've not seen this, this discussed before, what do you think this fuzzy object is? It's blue, it's got a bit of white, it's fuzzy. What do you see? What do you think it is? I'm hearing a few people say that. Uh, a light bulb. A light bulb. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you're, it's up to your imagination. You can see all sorts of things. I don't want to go there. Okay. Lights up. Okay. So if we take Earth and we make it as fuzzy as those pictures of Pluto, you really don't see any of the features that we see on Earth, clouds and continents and oceans and so on. So uh, our level of ignorance in Pluto is huge. So let's think a little bit about uh, things that are more familiar, I want to talk about the uh, pluto sharon moon planet system. So let's talk a bit about the Earth-Moon system. And here we have our familiar friend, the Moon. And you will see the Moon going through these phases on the right. Right, The illumination changes over the month. And those of you who have been out recently and during the day yesterday and uh, in the evening, and maybe when you came, I don't know, it was a bit cloudy this evening, you probably didn't see the moon, but yesterday you should have seen the moon. Um, think about which of these phases of the moon it is right now. Anybody remember? Is it in the middle? Is it full moon? Top right? Bottom left? What do you think? It's about sort of top right. I would guess it's somewhere between, between the very top right up here and the next one over, which would be somewhere in here, right? But somewhere in there, right? It's not quite half. Um, but notice the other thing that you see when you look at the moon is that you'll see, when you look at all of these pictures taken over a month, look at the features. And you will see that the features are the same, right? In particular, I like to look at this uh, Mare Crisium, which is this nice big uh, impact crater here, full of, full of lava. And um, you'll see when you look through over the month, it stays in the same location, okay? And so this means that the, from the Earth, we always only see one face of the moon. We don't see the backside of the moon. So the first time humans saw the backside of the moon was when the Russians sent, or Soviets as they were then, 1960s, early 60s, they sent a spacecraft out to look and saw the backside of the moon. So we, on Earth, always see the front side. And so if you think about it in your mind, you do the mental exercise, this means then that the spoon, the, the moon, the spoon, the moon spins um, once um, every orbit, okay? 
So it orbits the Earth every month, so say 30 days, and it spins. So the Earth spins uh, 30 times and the moon goes around once, it spins once in the month. Okay, so let's think about Pluto and Charon. Um, this is a rather different system. Pluto and Charon are uh, in a system where indeed uh, the same face faces uh, Pluto all the time. And so if you think of your two blue people on this, uh, this planet moon system, the two blue people will always see the other object in the sky all the time, right? And it'll be in the same place, it'll be high overhead. And now think about the red people. What do the red people in the system see? Stars. Do they see the other object? No. They're completely in ignorance of, if you're on the moon, ignorance of the planet, and if you're on the planet, ignorance of the moon. Okay, so this is a very bizarre system that's kind of alien to what we're used to. Okay, so this is interesting because you've got a big planet, uh, Pluto, and actually a really big moon, Sharon. It's about a sixth the mass of Pluto. Our moon is about 81, a one, 81 times smaller than the Earth. Uh, but here we have a big moon that's relatively close. And so the center of mass of this system is actually outside Pluto. So what this actually means, if you were to look at this, is that Pluto wobbles around uh, due to gravity, the mass of Sharon. And so we can actually measure this, and you can see that the center of mass is in fact outside of Pluto. Now, when we look at the system of what it really looks like when we're looking from the Earth, what we see is that Pluto is actually tipped on its side, not tilted by 23 and a half degrees like our Earth, but tilted more than 90 degrees, the North Pole is actually on the right-hand side of the system. And so um, what we're seeing is a system that's tilted on its side, just as the way that Uranus is a system that's tilted on its side. And back in the late 1980s, we had a system where the moon, Charon, would move in front and behind uh, Pluto like this. And this was really useful because it allowed us to measure the combined light of Pluto and Sharon, and see the dips in that combined light as Sharon moved in front and behind, and that allowed us to map out the light and dark on the surface of Pluto. This has been really useful um, to get a sense of what Pluto, uh, the distribution of light and dark on the surface of Pluto is. So this is our best map of Pluto and of Sharon derived through the Hubble Space Telescope and this technique of Pluto and Sharon moving in front and behind. And um, this is the best we can do from Earth. And you will see that Pluto is a little, little brownish and Sharon is sort of grayish. But look at those temperatures on the right. And it really doesn't matter whether you use the absolute temperature scale of Kelvin, the uh, metric scale that they use in the rest of the world outside the United States or Celsius, or whether you use the US system of Fahrenheit, it doesn't matter. It's darn cold, whichever way you look at it. And you think about the coldest temperatures, and the students in classes uh, at Hayden have been telling us that the temperatures that you might get here in this part of Colorado can be down to minus 40, minus 40, 45, maybe a bit of a wind chill, you can get colder, but nothing as cold as minus 340 Fahrenheit. And so at those temperatures, water, ice is like a rock, it's really solid, and many other things are solid too. So CO2, like dry ice, is solid too, and many other things are solid at this temperature. So why is it this color? Why is it this dirty color? Well, you can imagine what it's like when they grit the roads, you had fresh snow, lovely, lovely white snow. I wish you had lovely white, white snow today, but never mind. Um, and you can see that when they grit the roads, uh, you get a mixture of this brownie color with the snow. This may be what's happening here, but rock has been coming in from the outside and hitting it. Sometimes you get Utah dust coming in and hitting, landing on the snow. It could be the same sort of thing happening here. Or it 
could be that light from the sun, particularly UV light, reacting with those ices on the surface produce this sort of brown, gunky material. We don't know, because we really don't know what that stuff is. Sharon, on the other hand, seems to be more greyish in colour. But that's about it. We also know that it has an atmosphere, Pluto has an atmosphere, and this was first detected back in 1988 using a, uh, a telescope on a, uh, on a plane, looking out through a big window on the side of the plane, flying up above the Earth's atmosphere, looking at a star move behind Pluto, and looking at the blinking out of starlight, here in the blue figure on the right, uh, what it blinks out, the starlight blinks out and then comes back up again. But that blinking out is not instantaneous as it would be if it was just a solid object. There's a, a, there's a, a sort of gradient and turn off and turn back on gradually that tells us that there's an atmosphere of a certain thickness. And indeed, the thickness of the atmosphere is about 3 to 50 microbars. So the pressure in this room right now is one bar, one atmospheric pressure, and so this is between three and fifty millionths, a million times smaller uh, than the pressure in this room. So it's a very tenuous atmosphere. It's also extremely cold, uh, about fifty degrees above absolute zero. So that minus three hundred and forty or so um, degrees Fahrenheit. So it's very cold. A little bit of gases evaporate or sublime come into the atmosphere. The main gas is nitrogen, just like the gas we are breathing in this room. The dominant gas, dominant element is, is nitrogen. Uh, but also a bit of CO, carbon monoxide, which is that stuff that comes out of the back of, the, of, of, of cars. Uh, um, and, um, and some methane, a little bit of methane. So this atmosphere is escaping. Pluto's gravity is weak compared with um, Earth, and so the atmosphere escapes. And much this sort of behavior is very similar to that of comets. Comets are much, much smaller than Pluto, and when they get closer to the sun, like comet CG, I'm not going to try to pronounce the name, CG or C67, 69, 67? I can't remember the number now. Anyway, the one that the European lander hopped over, um, uh, that one produces gases that escape when it gets close to the sun in the same sort of rate that Pluto is losing its atmosphere. And so over a period of about four billion years, the life of Pluto is lost a kilometer or two of ice. So if you think of Yosemite Valley and those guys climbing Yosemite, El Capitan, it's about that height of that cliff has been lost over the age of the solar system of ices uh, from Pluto, and it makes this uh, uh, escaping atmosphere. But Pluto and Charon are sitting in a solar wind. The, the protons and electrons escaping from the sun, carrying out the sun's solar wind uh, uh, out um, through the solar system and going past the planets and as it interacts with this escaping atmosphere, it ionizes the atmosphere and carries it away to make a tail much like a comet. And the magnetic field is very weak, so the ionized atmosphere that is carried away um, produces these big gyrations of our very weak field at Pluto. But this is total guesswork. <laughs> I've written papers on this but they could be completely wrong. We don't know. There's only one way to find out. We have to go there. The other question is, what does it look like? The nearest thing we can do is to look at something like Neptune's moon triton. Now, it turns out that Pluto escaped getting captured by Neptune. Right? Remember that three to two resonance they have. They have to be in a happy equilibrium where they never get that close. Triton was not so lucky. It got caught, and we know that it's captured because it's actually a retrograde moon. It orbits the opposite way to the other moon. So we suspect it was captured. So it was formed at the same sort of place as Pluto in the outer part of the solar system, but it got caught by Neptune. And when Voyager flew by in 1989, it took these pictures of uh, Triton. 
And we think that it's the same sort of size as Pluto. We think it could be the same sort of structures. It's this weird surface. It's covered in ice. It has this sort of weird cantaloupe like terrain on the right. There's some impact craters, there's even the plumes, there's a bit of an atmosphere. So this is our best guess of what Pluto might be like, but this is a captured moon. It's not a planet of its own um, moon system. It could actually be very different, but this is our sort of guesswork of what we're trying to do. Maybe this is a close-up picture of Triton, um, that there are in fact plumes of black stuff that comes venting out. We don't know why or what it is. Maybe it's the same sort of thing on Pluto. We don't know. This is an artist's picture of this idea that there could be vents of, of material that's warmed up under the ice and then comes bursting out. We don't know. This is a very different from the sort of geology that we see on Mars or on Venus or on Earth or, or even the moons of the uh, Galilean moons of Jupiter, say. We just really, this is a different realm where ice is behaving in a very strange way because it's so cold. So what is it like inside Pluto or Sharon? Uh, well, on, on the left, we have Pluto and what we think it's like inside. We know from its density, it's about twice the density of water, that it has to be about half rock, about half um, ice. And so we think that it's got a mixture of rock in the interior with ice on the outside. It's possible, just possible, and this is very speculative, that there's a layer of liquid water quite deep under the ice. Um, I think that's a bit of wishful thinking on behalf of people who want there to be liquid water, so there might be bugs and whales. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, the, it, it's somewhat optimistic that there's water there. It has an icy crust on the outside. Sharon, on the other hand, which is about half the size of Pluto, we really don't know. It can become very uniform, uh, a mixture of rock and ice, a bit like a a slurpy, you know, when you, you, you make, a, a, make a, a drink where you mix up ice cream and then you put in, in um, chocolate chip bits and it's all mixed up, right? And then if it melts, the chocolate bits sink, sink down and you're left with the ice cream bits on the top. Um, that's what would happen if it got warm enough inside and then the top right is the sort of story that you would get where you have the denser material, the rocky material in the case of Sharon, sinking inside and the, and the um, icy bit on the outside. We really don't know which is the case for Sharon. For Pluto, we think it's big enough, there was enough heat to cause this differentiation, um, but we don't know for Sharon. But again, wild speculation. We don't really know what it's like. So, to find out what it's really like, we got to go. So back in 1989, uh, yes, it's kind of embarrassing to see this picture. <laughs> um, a young man called Alan Stone, who was a, a recently graduated PhD student from the University of Colorado, started to get people to campaign for a mission to Pluto. I got roped in. I'm not sure why. Gullible person. And we started campaigning to make this happen. It's interesting that in 1989, there was uh, a series of stamps put out by the US Postal Service. And to give you a sense of the date, notice the price of this stamp. <laughs> this was a first class stamp. Um, and it had all the planets, and then for Pluto, not yet explored. What an insult. Ah. Anyway, it was a good motivation to say, hey, let's go, let's go, let's go. And we campaigned to get a mission. So New Horizons was started. We actually had a campaign, we got together, people at NASA, Southwest Research, all the uh, Johns Hopkins applied uh, uh, a physics lab, all aerospace, Boulder. And we started proposing, and we uh, proposed to NASA to um, put together a mission that would go out to Pluto. Um, here is um, me dressing up in my proposal outfit, trying to get money from NASA, so I put on a jacket, and um, it seemed to work this time, we did actually get the mission, uh, but you can see, we had a camera on the side, we had an a, a antenna dish, this is a little smaller because it wouldn't have fit in the room if it was the right size, um, and we put some instruments on it. So we were really keen to try and get the mission to go to Pluto, 
And in 2001, in November, we were selected by NASA to do this. And so then we went embarked on this whole journey of putting together a mission to go to Pluto. So we designed the spacecraft, and it has a variety of components. You can see the big radio antenna dish on the top. Um, the power supply is sticking off to the side. This is a plutonium powered um, uh, uh, nuclear power system that uses the heat generated from radioactive decay. This is, um, and it's not bomb plutonium, it's uh, generated in a, in a nuclear power plant. Um, but the decay leads to heat that is then converted into electricity at about 300 watts to power that whole spacecraft. So that's three 100 watt light bulbs. It's probably about the power of that spotlight is about um, 300 watts. And the uh, spacecraft has an antenna, a radio antenna, that sends data back using a power of about 15 watts. So your refrigerator light bulb is about 15 watts. And so think of a refrigerator light bulb sending out power at the distance of Pluto, 30 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun, to send the signal back to Earth, which we receive with really big dishes about the size of this room to gather the data back. So we designed the spacecraft, we put together the instruments, all sorts of complicated diagrams, we go through reviews, we start building the spacecraft, put it together, and at first it's just some pieces like this, but later it gets more complicated. So here again, you can see the radio dish, you can see the power system. And here you see a bunch of engineers all dressed up in what looks like Ebola costumes, right? <laughs> but no, these are not to protect the engineers. They're wearing that suit to protect the spacecraft. Because you don't want a sensitive electronics to be contaminated. It's got to last for 10 years. You don't want it to be contaminated by the dirt on your shoes, or by the grease on your fingers, or by the dirt in your hair, or whatever. So we cover up the engineers. Every day they have to go into this very clean room that is evacuated to try and keep it very clean, to keep the electronics in their best possible state uh, before we launch it. Um, we do all sorts of tests. We call the bacon shake test. This is the spin test. Um, to see that everything, all the components will survive launch. And then eventually, uh, we put on all the instruments. And these all have sort of rather interesting names. We decided to move away from acronyms towards actual names, like Ralph, Alice, Rex, Laurie. The others are acronyms. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about these. We get to use the radio antenna to communicate with Earth. This is a big dish. Um, that's, uh, this is probably the one that's in California, Goldstone, that will be receiving data from the mission. Uh, but we'll use that uh, radio communication to also probe the atmosphere and measure the Doppler shift, the speed of the spacecraft as it moves past Pluto. So that will be an important thing. We have a camera called Lorry that will take high resolution pictures. Those will be very important. We're getting good ones now, they'll only get better. We'll have a, a camera that can measure different colors, particularly in the infrared that will tell us about the composition. And we'll find out what that brown stuff is, that orangey stuff on the surface. What is that dump? What is that stuff? Is it, is it rock or is it organic material? Um, we will know this by looking at the infrared spectrometer. This was built by Ball Aerospace, by the way, in Boulder, Colorado. The ALICE instrument uh, is out of Southwest Research in San Antonio. That's a UV instrument. It will look at the sun as New Horizons moves behind Pluto. And so it will measure the absorption of UV light by the atmosphere and tell us what the atmosphere is made of. We will also have a two-particle instrument, the SWAT, which is solar wind around Pluto and another instrument called Pepsi. Note the extra S, so it's not a violation of um, trademark. Um, which measures the charged particles that are in the solar wind. And we'll be able to measure this, this cometry-like interaction and get a sense of the total amount of material that is being lost from the atmosphere of Pluto. Finally, 
and most important is the instrument built by the University of Colorado students, undergraduates. Undergraduate students have been helping us put together this instrument that will detect dust. And dust is really important. The space dog moves out through the solar system. It's been detecting dust since it first left Earth. It tells us how those pieces of the solar system, the pieces of the asteroid belt, the pieces of the planet belt, bump into each other, break up, and generate dust, or comets, like the comet CG that came through that the uh, European Rosetta spacecraft is studying. Uh, the dust that gets sent out from those comets, we will measure this with this, we are measuring, we have been measuring for nine years, the dust distribution through the solar system and getting a sense of how the solar system formed and evolved. They're detecting, you might wonder, okay, so how much dust is there out there, right? I mean, space is empty, space is a vacuum, there isn't any stuff out there. That uh, instrument, which is about the size of my laptop, so it's sort of this size, um, has been detecting on average about one hit a day, one piece of dust a day, or a day to a week. So there's not a lot of stuff out there, right? But over nine years, we've been measuring the distribution of dust in the solar system. So we're really proud of this. We have the students started and got involved back in uh, when we first started in around 2000 in designing and putting together this young um, uh, Kelsey Bryant bottom left, testing the instrument. She's now a professional engineer at the uh, University of Colorado's Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics, where I work and build more instruments that will go to different places in the solar system. But we're very proud of the fact that students who come to the University of Colorado in Florida can get involved in these space missions. They can be involved in operating missions. They can be involved in building instruments and testing instruments, all aspects of space. Um, if they come and work at the University of Colorado. So once we built the spacecraft, we put it on the top of a big rocket. This is the Ariane, Ariane 5, um, built and designed. Basically, it's out of Denver, South Denver, um, out of Lockheed Martin, a collaboration with Boeing. Um, it's put together in Florida. We slap a sticker on the side, just like the sticker you've got, uh, but a bit bigger. And then, we launch it, and of course everybody goes out to watch the launch, January 19th, 2006. So just last week, or 10 days ago or so, we celebrated um, nine years of being in orbit. Uh, on our way, actually not in orbit, it's escape trajectory, it's not in orbit at all. Escaping from the Earth, escaping from um, the solar system on its way past Pluto. Uh, and so, let's look at this orbit. It left Earth, it left Mars trajectory here, it goes past Jupiter. It's a bit of a kick. We're naturally on an escape trajectory from the solar system. After uh, Jupiter, we crossed the orbit of Saturn. Saturn wasn't there, we just kept going. And then we went past the orbit of uh, Uranus. Uranus wasn't there either, we kept going. We went past Eventually, it takes a long time, nine years, we uh, go past the orbit of Neptune. Neptune wasn't there either. And then eventually, we will get to fly past Pluto and then keep going. So, uh, we're now at this date. Uh, we are due to arrive in July 2014. That's Bastille Day for those of you who follow French culture, enjoying the beheading of people in... Anyway, that's 10 days after Independence Day, we get rid of those pesky Brits Day in the United States. Um, and uh, so we got six months to go. But notice the speed of this spacecraft. This thing is really moving. It's taken um, nine years to get there, but it's moving at 33,000 miles an hour, right? So the fastest planes are sort of a few hundred miles an hour, uh, or a bullet, you said was, what was the speed of a speeding bullet? Can you give me a, some well, comparison? I said this is about 100 times that. 100 times the, the speed of a speeding bullet. So this is really moving. So we have a really big rocket, we throw it really fast, and then we have it fly past Jupiter, get a little bit of a kick, and it keeps going. And 
and um, it is on its way out there, and it will arrive um, in, in, uh, on the 14th of July. Notice one thing that's particularly interesting is that the, uh, it takes light to go from Earth to Pluto and back, or light isn't so important. We actually use radio signals, which also moves at the speed of light. Um, radio signals travel at the speed of light out in vacuum, and it also takes uh, nearly nine hours. Uh, that's the current round trip time. It'll be closer to eight hours because the Earth will be on the other side of the sun in six months' time. And so uh, it takes a long time to get the signal back from New Horizons, about four and a half hours. Um, but think about it. We're going to arrive at this system. If there's an issue, uh, we can. The, we can only get. It takes four and a half hours for us to get a signal to the system, and it takes four and a half hours for the signal to come back to us. It's not a sort of thing where you can ride a joystick and move this spacecraft and dodge hazards that might be there. Um, you've got a four and a half de hour delay between when you want to change something and the response um, at the spacecraft. So this is particularly important because we now find that Pluto doesn't have one moon, Charon. It has five moons. This is a series of Hubble Space Telescope pictures taken over the past couple of years. And you can see that we now have these extra moons. And this means a lot of us are getting a little worried. Uh-oh, could there be debris? Now remember, we're moving at 33,000 miles an hour. And the speck of dust moving at that speed towards the spacecraft, because we have the spacecraft going into it, is like a bowling ball moving at running speed. Okay, so it could cause a lot of damage to your sensitive electronics to hit the spacecraft. So we, but we don't, we can't, with that uh, four and a half hour one way uh, communication time, we can't just sort of dodge anything. We have to anticipate how uh, we need to approach this system, take pictures as we approach it, and then make, then make a decision about how we might change our trajectory. We're not going to have a lot of warning time, partly because of this round trip light uh, track communication time, but also because the spacecraft is moving so fast. It'll move through the system in about two hours. So we'll get pictures better than Hubble in May, but it'll be a long time, we'll be really close before we can say, yes, we have a problem of a danger, we may have to change the trajectory or not. So it's a bit of a nerve-wracking situation. So this is the best picture we have from Hubble on the right. You can see it's very fuzzy, very poor resolution, because that's the best we can do from Earth. 33 astronomical units, 33 times the distance of the Earth from the Sun away from this object. The one on the left is the New Horizons best picture so far. You can see Pluto and Charon isn't as good as Hubble yet. 15th of May is the sort of deadline for when we expect to get images better than Hubble. So when we do fly by, we'll be flying past Pluto at a sort of distance of this picture of the Earth. And on the right, you may recognize Manhattan, New York, Central Park. So you can see the scale that we will resolve on Pluto will be a bit like taking a picture like this and being able to see this building of this college from space. Okay? And so we'll, Pluto will be able to see mountains, impact craters, geological features on the scale of this college, the building that you're sitting in, will be that sort of scale. So we'll have, compared with those really fuzzy pictures where you can see virtually nothing on the surface of Pluto, um, we'll be able to see some level of structures and the geology of this really um, unknown world in the outer solar system. So this is an artist's picture of what it may be like. I don't know how accurate it is. It's just an idea of one person. You've got this big moon of Sharon with the sun coming behind. The sun is very weak. It's 30 times further away, so 900 times weaker. It's a bit like a full moon here on Earth. 
Uh, but it's still fairly strong. You could probably read a book if you were on, which I mean, the cold to read the book, you need a lot of gloves and a lot of things to eat one, but you know, uh, you could tack it. Uh, and there's a lot of ice there, and maybe dirty ice, maybe some rock, we don't really know. This is a conjecture of what it might be like. It could be completely different. So, um, this is another artist's picture. It also has plumes and an atmosphere. Um, we don't know. Watch out. Pay attention. There'll be a lot of stuff in the, in the media about this, and um, we're nearly there. Thank you very much. Can you, can you bring up the lights a little bit? Because it'd be nice to do some questions. I think there may be people in the audience who have some questions, and, and it would be good for me to see you. Um, okay, you got any questions? Or is he wrong? Yes, sir. Uh, I think you mentioned that you would be in the area for two hours after nine years. Yes. Crazy? So pictures will be better than Hubble in May, okay? But we're going to go through the system very fast when we get up close, okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, we're going to go by with our spacecraft and the cameras, and we're going to go click, 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 and we go by, and in about two hours, we'll take a whole bunch of pictures. And then it'll take a long time to download and send those pictures back to work because of the size of the antenna or the amount of power we can use. You know, it'll take us actually about 18 months to get all the data back. So we have a really big storage device. You know, it's like one of those big uh, terabyte drives. I don't actually know the number of terabytes we've got before, but it's a lot. Right. Memory is cheap. Mm -hmm. You can go to um, these days, you can buy memory pretty cheap. It's the same sort of thing. And so we put it on board and then we sent it back over about 18 months. So it was not possible to go into orbit? No, uh, we could not go into orbit around Pluto because Pluto's gravity is really weak. Think of the size of the Earth and then Pluto and Sharon. And so we could have carried a lot of fuel to go into orbit but we prefer to carry a bunch of cameras. You know, it's pointless going there and getting the orbit if you can't carry the cameras and the information is any back. So it was a choice. First time we usually go to planets, we fly by, take some pictures, send them back, and then we decide what to do next. So next time we'll go to orbit. We can carry off on fuel. Okay, another question. Okay, yes. Is there any plans for after it passes by, by Pluto to go explore something else? Perfect. Could have put you right there to ask that question. Um, yes, we're going to go through the Kuiper Belt, and we hope to find another target. So remember back to the very beginning of the talk, where we had that picture of all those red objects, the Kuiper Belt, right? And remember we said there were two regions where there were kind of a gaps, and one of them is in the direction of Pluto, where the Milky Way is, and we have a hard time detecting Kuiper Belt objects. It's not that we don't think they're there. It's just that they're hard to see when you've got this background of billions and billions of stars, right? And so we are flying out through the Kuiper Belt in the direction of the Milky Way. We've actually had a lot of effort using ground-based telescopes the Hubble time, and we found two candidate objects. We have to make a decision fairly soon that we might be able to fly by and we can make a, a trajectory correction of about two degrees. So that's the angle between your eye and two fingers up in the sky. So about two, we can make that kind of trajectory change. We've got enough fuel to do that. And so we're, we've got one object, or two, two objects that are candidate <coughs> objects at that distance. So we'll fly past, within about 18 months, two years, another object. And that will be great, because then we'll get two objects that can kind of help, not just one and get a sense of what's going on. They're all very different, and so we're hoping to get another one. Great question, good one. Okay, somebody at the back. Somebody come on. He's got a question. Yes, you, yes. I don't understand why in all the magazines I've seen over the years that you have these beautiful photos that supposedly came from Hubble and they go way back. Ah. Why are those so detailed, but who knows closer Right. Those objects, those beautiful clouds, are really large, right? 
and they're large in real physical space, they're very far away. But in angular size, they are still pretty big compared to the size of Pluto. Okay, so we were doing a great exercise in the classrooms this past couple of days, and you can think of the size of Pluto being, if you have the sun that's this size, right? The Earth would be outside that door, just about. Pluto would be half a mile away, and it would be the size of a grain of sand. Okay, so really small. And the problem is that when we see Pluto, we're not seeing its own light, we're seeing reflected sunlight. So it's dim, it's a long way away, and it appears very small. And so compared with those big star systems, those big astronomical things like big galaxies and so on and so forth. Even though those galaxies and stars are very, very long way away, they're really big and very bright. And the problem with Pluto is it's pretty small and it's still and, and pretty far away, right? As a planetary object. Does that kind of give you I know it's really difficult because these scales are really hard, things gotta get in your mind. But the fact that it doesn't glow like a star is a big part of the problem. But that's an excellent question. Yeah. Any other questions? Somebody at the back. Okay, yes, you, at the very back. Not the very, very back, the next to the very back. You, yes, you. No, the woman in front of you. Her, eating an apple. <laughs> Do you have a question? You? No? Somebody there had a question. Okay, and then we'll go to you at the very, very back. Okay, ask your question. Um, well, before, you had uh, you had the two planets on the stick. You were going to show how it rotates, right? Well, um, just before that, we had the presentation where there were the two people who yes. said that the red yes. people couldn't yes. see the, um, the other planet. Yes. Is Sharon a small enough size and close enough to Pluto that, that on Sharon you'd be able to see the edge of Pluto around it? Oh, you mean like an eclipse? Is that so, what you're talking about? So, yeah, you, so, so that you could just see it. If, if you were on the side of Sharon looking at Pluto, it would be quite big in the sky. I don't even know the exact number, but it would be certainly bigger, um, actually, than looking at the Earth from the moon. So it would be pretty big. It's on this side. Okay? <coughs> but if you were on the other side, <coughs> and I'm not going to spin this and turn it off, but you know, if you're on the other side, you just don't see it, right? You can't look through the moon. So it's not it's not big enough to be seen around. No, you, you, no, no, no way, no way, no way, <laughs> right? When you're on the other side of the Earth and the moon's are behind, you can't see it. You, you just, I think this should be a great science fiction story. I'm trying to get someone to write a science fiction story about this because I think we're really cool. Okay, so question, right? Very, 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 back. yes. How does it carry enough fuel? So the fuel it carries is plutonium-238. And that is not bomb plutonium. It's made from neptunium in, in reactors. And um, what happens is, it's just a, few, a couple of kilograms of this, and um, it generates heat. It decays, like radioactive things decay, puts out alpha particles. And then you have a sheath around it that absorbs the heat. And then you have a temperature difference. It's hot inside, cold on the outside. And that temperature difference can be used gener to generate a voltage. It's called a thermocouple. It's used quite a lot in various technologies. And so that voltage provides enough power to drive the spacecraft. Like I said, it's only 300 watts, three regular light bulbs, or maybe one really bright light bulb. But that's enough to power the whole spacecraft. And, and it keeps going for a long time. The half-life, I think, is about 76 years. So it'll keep providing power um, for another 10 years. Outer solar system, you cannot explore using solar power, right? The inner solar system, you can use solar energy. Once you get beyond Jupiter, you really can't use solar panels. The solar panels don't have to be too big. You really couldn't make it work, okay? So we have to use this nuclear power system um, to, to, and do that very carefully um, to make it work out in space. Yeah, good question. Okay, you have a question. Yeah. Yes, you in white there. Um, so um, now that we know there's like alpha <coughs> objects in the Kuiper belt, is Pluto exceptional anymore? Like why Pluto? Is it just because we have decades of data? Okay, so um, in 1989, 
Uh, that was um, in 1989. Pluto was the only object out there, right? The next one was 92, and since then, right? So we started campaigning for this campaign to go out there before these other objects were discovered, yeah. right? And then. It's, been, it's, it's the largest one, or the next to largest one. The other object, Eris, is more or less the same size. We can't really, we don't actually know the size of Pluto. Well, I mean, it's sort of like this-ish. We don't really know the accuracy of the size, right? Um, to about 50 kilometers, something like that. Um, so we don't actually know which is but this is really massive. There are a bunch of objects that are about the size of Pluto out there. They seem to have different colors, different shapes, different, not, they're all sort of round, so that makes them sort of like, like a planet. So that's one reason why we think, you know, if it's big enough to pull itself into making it a round shape, then it, call it a planet. But do you think it's like the data is going to be indicative of a lot of objects in the paper belt? And is that well, we don't know. I mean, they seem to, when we look at them, when we look at them in different filters to get the colors, they seem to have different colors. Some have moons, they have different orbits. I mean, it would be fantastic to go to other ones. But the problem is, it's a long way. It takes nine years to get there, and it's not easy. You can't just start off like, oh, let's go to this one. Oh, let's go to this one. Oh, let's go to that one. Oh, let's go to the other one. You know, you can't do that. It takes a lot of fuel. And fuel is really heavy and difficult to take up there into space. So we probably have to go one at a time. And I think. Pluto is going to be exciting enough to make people say, let's go and look at a couple of other ones. You know? But that's going to take another nine years. Yeah. Yes? Technically, how do you get the pictures back? How do you get the pictures back? Okay. The same way, basically, that when you take pictures on your new digital camera or your phone, and you want to upload them through the internet um, and send them to your grandkids or your brothers and sisters, you know, it's the same sort of thing. You're transmitting data either along the pipe or through radio waves or microwaves, in the case of, of, of wireless um, phone systems, uh, out you know, to someone else who receives it. And so the um, antenna on the spacecraft is a radio dish. It sends a radio signal to Earth. We have dishes on the Earth, which are about the size of this room, that will receive that signal. And those of you who are uh, interested in the geekiness of this, it travels at the speed of light, where you, you think of the amount of bits per second, it's going to be kilobits per second. It's not, it's like dial up, right? Um, ancient days of dial up. Um, the bits are actually separated by about 200 miles apart. Think about each bit. Okay, so I mean, it's very low rate information. We'll gather that information, and that will send us the information to make a picture, in the same sort of way as we're sending information over the internet. And can you get sound back? Sound. We're not, we don't have anything that is recording sound. Okay? It would be very interesting. I don't think we'd hear it. Space is so empty that actually sound doesn't travel. So that movie Gravity was just complete rubbish, right? <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be much of a movie if it had to. There's very little sound. So no, we haven't recorded any sound. But we're not in the no. And actually, unlike other spacecraft that have carried uh, electric antennas, that have measured electrostatic static, we're not actually carrying any on this spacecraft. Other spacecraft, yes, but not this one. We just couldn't do everything. Yeah. Yes, yes. We're going to look at all the moons. We're going to look at Sharon. Remember, Pluto and Sharon are orbiting each other every six and a half days. We want to get each um, side. So we'll get really good pictures on one side, less good pictures on the other side. But yes, as we approach from um, the 15th of um, May, when we start to get pictures better than other, we'll be looking and looking and looking and at the moons and looking for dust in between and everything. Yeah, good point. Okay, question over here. What kind of, what coordinate system do you use to navigate from the Earth up to that vicinity? 
Um, it's called J2000, JPL system. Okay, we need to use a navigation system. And, you know, JPL, the Jet Propulsion Alpha Pasadena, has knowledge of all the objects in the solar system to pretty high accuracy. So, something like um, nine significant figures. So we know where objects are, we know the gravitational interaction, they do a many body simulations and, and they check those numbers. So we know the locations of objects very accurately in the solar system. So we can use our navigation to do that. This is, I've got more to this story. The next part is we use cameras. And as we approach, we take pictures and we compare the locations of the spacecraft to these objects very accurately as best we can update to some level of accuracy where these objects are. So you think, okay, great, you can correct a little bit, move, maneuver a little bit to get it right. And we know that we will go where we aim to go pretty precisely. I mean, that's, that I'm not worried about. But this is what I am worried about. When you look at something in the sky, and you measure its location in the sky, you can measure its location this way, right, across the sky, like if you think of this as an x, y axis on a piece of paper, you can say where it goes across, or, or right ascension declination if you're an astronomer. But you don't measure its distance. You don't know its size. You can measure it, but you don't know how far away it is. So we know very precisely where Pluto is in the sky, in an XY way, wherever it is that way. But we don't know how far away it is. And the uncertainty in the distance of Pluto is about the radius of Pluto. So here we are, think this Pluto, we're going to come by and we're going to go click, 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 Send the data back to work. But we we can't communicate. We've got to remember the four and a half hour communication time, right? We can't correct it in advance. So what if instead of being click, 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 I'm thinking it's here, it's actually here. And I've taken the pictures of blank space. Uh-oh. We spent nine years getting there, and we've taken pictures of blank space. What are we going to do? So what we're going to do is this. We're going to have a whole sequence. Click here, click there, click, 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 look at the moons, look at the moons. Look at this, click, look at Pluto, click, click, right? We've got it all planned. Detail, thousands of sequences, all carefully put together. But the zero time, the closest approach, we can shift in that sequence. So when we approach, a few days before, we'll take pictures of Pluto, we'll get a sense and sort of judge its distance as best we can. There'll be a little bit of parallax, we'll get a little bit of sideways view. And then we can adjust the timing so that we're pretty sure that we're taking those click, 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 clicks at the right time when it really is there, not black space. But that's tricky. So we, of course, we planned a few extra clicks. So we're going to click, 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 and a few blank spaces, just in case it happens to not be where we thought it was. So this is this is unusual. We don't have this problem with Jupiter. We don't have this problem with Saturn. We don't have this problem with Mercury, because they're all familiar, close objects that we have really, really accurate. And I say nine significant places, maybe ten or twelve or fifteen. I don't know. Right, but with Pluto, <laughs> not so good. So we're sort of flying by the seat of our pants here, having to make an adjustment as we get. Well, as, as you reach the terminal region, what coordinate system? Do you what coordinate system we use? We have a Pluto-centric system that's been devised. Yeah, but we've got to laugh at the fact that its north pole is spinning this way. And, yeah, so we've got a well-defined system using the spin axis, and I can. We've actually got a very nice young woman who's uh, from MIT. She was studying Pluto, and she does a very nice little animation of describing you holding your left hand up here, your right hand up here, and 
or the net rotates around. Coordinate systems are fun. Okay, anyway, question? You, yeah, you, sir. Have you found any anomalies in the uh, dust collection sequence along the travels? Like the um, place where I had a pres goes? yes, yes, I had a presentation actually a couple of days ago by the guy who's in charge of that, so, you know, that's a Colorado professor, Nihai Harani, and he was reporting on the dust stuff collected by the student dust collector, and there seems to be several populations of dust. There's dust that comes from the grinding up of stuff in the, in the asteroid belt that gets pushed out by the solar wind and radiation pressure that's going outwards. And then you have comets that release dust as they come in from the outer solar system, as they come in. So you remember the tails of comets. They don't really start off until they get to about the distance of Jupiter, but then they start sending out material. And then the third source is the grinding up of objects in the outer solar system. And they've been able to, to, to match, oops, match their observations um, by putting a combination of these three sources together. So um, they're sort of working on getting that ready for publication. But yeah, that's, that they've got some really nice observations from that. Yeah, good. Okay, so a couple more. Shall we? Yeah, two. What is the size of the probe? Size of the probe. Excellent. I didn't show you that, did I? Um, well, you remember those engineers who dressed up in those white suits? They were standing around it. <clears throat> so the antenna, right, the dish, is about this, right? The space bar is about the size of the ground camera, which is about the size of a medium-sized car, <clears throat> SUV, right? Not as big as a big, big farm truck, but bigger than a mini. That's not very helpful. Grand piano, have you ever seen a grand piano? What do you have in the, about the size of that table, but sort of square? Underweight. Underweight? It's about a ton. Yeah. But, you know, which is not a lot for the size. You have to right, design things to be, and a lot of that is actually fuel, because we need to do some trajectory corrections. And we actually have to move the spacecraft with little thrusters to get the cameras to go tick, tick, tick. They're not on a gimbal, they're not on a platform that rotates. You have to take the whole spacecraft, and you have to take the whole spacecraft and, and move it. Okay, so I use bits of fuel to do that. Yeah? What is the fuel that's used? The fuel is hydrazine to do those um, fuel maneuvers. Hydrazine, I don't know what the chemical formula, it's got carbon and hydrogen in some combination, but I don't know the exact combination. Yeah, you guys know what hydrogen is? Chemical formula of hydrogen? Yeah, it's a fairly light, um, uh, very, very high, you know, it's like um, a high octane fuel. I can't give you more information than that. Look it up on the internet. Sorry, I can't be hydrogen. I know it's in hydrogen. Yes, sir. They take me in pictures and went by two. And yes. how, and do they have, are they going to collect any data after they get built? Um, yes, so we do have to go past these two uh, other objects, or one, at least one other object, and we will get more as we go past that one. How about past that? Uh, past Jupiter. Uh, sorry, past um, Pluto. We'll go past one other kind of that object, at least, if not two. But then that's it for the cameras, because it's kind of empty out there. Right? There really isn't a whole lot out there. It's really nothing really to look at. Um, but we will use uh, three of the instruments. The two particle detectors will measure the solar wind as we go out, just as Voyager, and after it went past Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, it continued to measure the solar wind. It is still measuring the solar wind. Voyager is actually at 120 astronomical units. So that's four times further away than Pluto. And it's still gathering data and sending it back. It's measuring the solar wind and the magnetic field out of the very edges of the solar system. So new horizons will continue to measure the particles in the outer solar system, and it will continue to measure the dust. And we'll send those data back for as long as we can, which 10 years, something like that. Again, pictures of Jupiter. But not pictures. No, we of Jupiter. The pictures of Jupiter we took when we flew by. And those are on the web, and you should be able to see those. We took a lot of pictures of the moons, volcanoes on Eo, and a few other things like that, and they're on the web. 
They are available. Yeah, they're not quite as good as the Cassini ones, but they're pretty good pictures. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How exactly does the dust detector detect dust? Okay, so that's an interesting question. The thing's about this size, and it's got about a dozen different um, pieces of plastic. But this is very special plastic. Because what happens is when the dust goes through that piece of plastic, it generates an electrical signal across plastic. And then we measure that electrical signal and then send that back to the Earth. So it's a very special piece of electric plastic um, that is carefully designed to measure those sort of things. Yeah, but that's a, that's a good thing. And, and are there several, it looks like there are several yes. cells. Is that in case one breaks or something? Or is it just um, just to increase the, yeah, it's, it's partly just to increase the area. Okay. Um, and, but it's better to have multiple sort of redundancy, so if one is, you know, so you increase the area, but increase the redundancy at the same time. Yeah, good point, very good point. Yeah. Um, back in those days, uh, how did they uh, sterilize for uh, microbes? Excellent. So, we're not too worried about Pluto having a whole lot of light. This guy's an astrobiologist. He's worried about light in other sources, other places, other places in our solar system. Pluto is so dumb cold, we're not too worried. Even if we were to hit Pluto, which is not going to happen, really. Um, we would not want to carry Earth bones to Pluto. And on the way, if we go past the Jovian system, we certainly don't want to hit Europa and carry bugs from Earth. Um, you're probably are fully aware about the horrors in, of invasive species that we take when we pass the Earth to another part of the Earth, and how it goes gangbusters and causes all sorts of destruction to the ecosystem. We don't want to take bugs from Earth to another place in the solar system and infect it with Earth bugs, because we'd never be able to understand the natural life of that environment. So we have to sterilize our space plant, and um, usually it's component by component you have to do this. Some components you just heat them up in an oven. But if it's very sensitive electronics, you want to take your part and put it into an oven in the cleaning cycle, right? That's not a good idea. So then you have to wipe it with alcohol and so on and so forth to do that. So um, for Europa, sorry, for, for Pluto it's not such a problem because we don't think too much of a hazard. But boy, when we go to Europa, the mission to Europa, we're going to have to be very, very careful not to contaminate that ocean that could be underneath the ice should we buy any accident hit the surface. So this planetary protection, protecting other planets from Earth bumps is a big deal. And we have to be very careful in, in trying to send stuff out of Earth's atmosphere that we have to make sure it's safe um, and not carry bugs from Earth with it. Um, and usually we have to go to the variety of processes depending on what Okay, let's go for the very last question. You can hear it. Uh, is it typical for moons to only show one face, like our moon and like Sharon? So our moon and Sharon keeps the same face to the, to the Earth, right? Um, indeed it is. So the Galilean moons, Eo, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto of Jupiter. Um, the, the larger moons of Saturn, it's the same thing. Um, they keep the same face, and it's a gravity, it's a tidal locking system that that happens. The rare thing with Pluto and Charon is the fact that the planet is also tidally locked to the moon. So unlike Earth, that spins sort of 30 times for every once the moon goes around, these things go Phase one together. Okay, but that's that's unusual. Um, but nearly all big moons are um, keep the same face to their planet. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty common. It's very common. Yeah. One more big round of applause for Dr. <laughs>